Hare Krishna, everyone. This is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology. Today, I'm hanging out with my friend Bojadev Prabhu, um, who is also uh, on the path of Bhakti Yoga. He came and uh, did an interview with me last month. Uh, some of you might have seen that episode. It was really fun uh, to talk to Bojadev about his path with Bhakti Yoga and some of the interesting twists and turns that his life have taken. Um, he's back again. We're going to try to do this maybe once a month to field interesting questions. Um, it's more fun to really, in my opinion, to talk about Bhakti with other people. So I'm really happy to have Boja Dave here and he's a, a veteran and, and um, you know, I consider him uh, something of a, a mentor in addition to a friend. So um, yeah, I'm really glad to have uh, Boja Dave here and we're going to field a question that we got today. This is a crossover video. Some of you guys know I do all astrology content on my channel, but a lot of it is really informed by my um, practice of bhakti yoga. And so occasionally I'll do a video that's just more purely uh, about bhakti and um, also um, let people know, and, and as a way of letting people know that if you go to my website, you can click on the bhakti tab and get access, free access to uh, an entire private YouTube channel filled with bhakti yoga content that's just exclusively bhakti yoga. And you can sign up for my newsletter and get other cool bhakti content uh, events and, and things like that that you can check out. So I do these once in a while to make sure that people who are always asking me, hey, I really like the yoga, the yoga philosophy that you infuse in your astrology videos. How can I learn more? So these videos are meant to give you a little bit more of a taste for that. So anyway, thanks Bojadev uh, Prabhu for being here today. And um, I'm really excited to dive into this question. Good to see you again. Right on. So uh, this question um, uh, I, I got a little bit ago. I shared it with Boja Day. We were both like, wow, really nice question. Here, here it goes. And I'm going to read this email because I think the context is really important. Hi, Achuta. Some years ago, I did an experiment. I asked my closest ones how they feel loved, not how they knew they were loved, but what was what people did that gave them the feeling of being loved by them. The outcome was really amazing. The first thing I realized was that I was showing my love to everybody in the way that I feel loved, but not necessarily in the way that they did. But now I had new information to change that. One of my daughters said she felt loved with physical contact and hugs. Later on that same day, she was sharing with me her frustration over an argument she had with one of her sisters. She felt disempowered and sad. There was really nothing I could do, but I remembered how she felt loved. And instead of saying anything, I hugged her and caressed her back while hugging her. She then cried. She knew that I was choosing to hug her and caress her because I wanted her to feel my love for her. And I knew she was receiving and interpreting my love as love because she had just shared with me that that was the way that she felt loved. That love felt potentialized by the awareness that we had, that we each had of what the other knew. It was very beautiful. Now, how do I know how God feels loved? How do I know how God feels loved? Do the sacred scriptures talk about this? Thanks for the time to read the email. So thank you um, for your question. Uh, really great question. Something that I know um, we have a really good veteran help here with us today and Boja Dave Prabhu as well to talk about this. So I'm just going to hand it over to you, Boja Dave. Um, for, what do you think about this question? What are your initial thoughts about it? And, and what do you think? Uh, how do we answer this question of how God feels loved? It's a very uh, great question. It has a lot of really amazing aspects and thoughtful aspects to it. And um, the one that stuck out originally was how do we, as she, she mentions, is there anything in the sacred scriptures that describe how God feels loves? Because, because who are we uh, you know, as normal people to understand the mind of God or even know that? But there is, a, and so asking to, to find out from the higher authority from the scriptures, which, um, sometimes God gives directly himself or gives directly through his representatives is the best way to, to understand that. So um, one thought that comes to mind is, you know, she was, you know, very self-aware and thinking that and, and expressing how when she was giving love, trying to give love is the way that she thought it should be given or what she thought would um, please that person. But you actually have to, what she did ask that person what makes them feel love more than just knowing that some intellectual idea of it so uh an example comes to mind of uh, a teacher asking his student to bring bring him a glass of water and the student thinks well 
and we have milk here. Milk is better. Of course, if you're vegan, maybe not so much, but almond milk might be better or uh, some substitute. So the, the disciple goes back, the student goes back and gives the, the glass of milk and, and thinking that he's done the right thing. And actually the teacher explains, no, I, if I wanted water. So to get over our own conceptions of what really love is, you have to ask that person, which is, you know, part of her experience and question, which is, which is great. So in going to the scriptures, there's a number of things that um, it can look to that uh, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, there's a nice uh, verse when it's described as approaching, when one is approaching God, that in the uh, ninth chapter, uh, in the uh, 29th verse, Krishna says, I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. I am equal to all. But whoever renders service to me in devotion is a friend in me, and I am also a friend to him. Uh, it says earlier, all that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, as well as any austerities you may perform, should be done as an offering to me. And also, if one offers me with love and devotion a, a leaf, a flower, a fruit, or water, I will accept it. So... Part of the part of the equation here is understanding that actually, even though God is all pervasive, He's the source of all the brilliant light that, that sustains the universe. He's at the same time a person. Uh, we learned that from Lord Caitanya. It's called the philosophy of Achintya Veda Aveda Tattva, meaning that God is individually a person as well as being all pervasive. Um, so sometimes this is explained that uh, suppose you are a big CEO of a of a corporation that you may be sitting in your office, but the influence of your desires and orders are spread throughout the whole organization, the whole building. So even though you're sitting in one place, your influence is felt you know, throughout your organization. So uh, in a similar way, um, you know, God has that same ability to be localized, but yet ever present. And another connected example to that is that the CEO might uh, have certain amount of uh, protocol and formality at the office, which he enjoys, but he actually enjoys more intimacy when he goes home to his family and might not like to get on his knees and let his kids crawl over all over him and ride him like a horse. So there's different levels of way, the way God feels love and appreciates love coming in different moods. Um, so I want to read one more thing and then expand on this a little bit. Uh, because it said, it's described that God being a person and the approach to God he enjoys, so how he enjoys being loved, um, is, can be, uh, they're all equal in a sense, but there's a, there's a variety of ways in the approach. One is approaching through on reverence, where you think that, that you understand that God, there's something much, much greater than myself, and God has a personality, he's, he's worshipable, it's like the, the amazing things, that, this amazing creation, um, it's a, a person with some humility will respect that and feel some sense of awe and, and reverence. And uh, so that's, that's one type of, of uh, relationship where God is, appreciates that we see him. You know, it's uh, God appreciates being seen and recognized. And he's, he's in one sense, he's, he's described as Atmaram where he's completely self-satisfied. He's not a needy person. He doesn't need worship. He doesn't need food. He doesn't need anything from us, but he's expanded himself in order to exchange, have loving exchanges and expand the sense of love. So when we, this is first called, this is called Shantaras or mellow, where one recognizes that that's, that's God is, is, is amazing. We see him and he sees us seeing him and appreciates that. And I think that we all, you know, uh, have, have that experience of just, you know, wanting to be just seen, not out of ego, but just, just recognized as existing. And so that's the very approach to God. It's a, you know, I had a small experience of that, that I was at the LA airport one time and I was on the phone on the curb and limousine pulls up and Muhammad Ali gets out of the car and I'm sitting talking on the phone and I'm looking and I think, wow, that's Muhammad Ali. He kind of over, looks over and I'm still talking on the phone, but no one was around. He looked at me and he just kind of like, like nodded his head and, and kind of acknowledged me. And I, to me, that was such a, 
you know, gracious thing to do that I'm not nobody, you know, I didn't, you know, this guy's a famous guy is wealthy, famous, attractive to so many people. And then, and within like two seconds, people walking on the sidewalk said, Oh my God, Muhammad Ali. And they started rushing the car. And everything. But anyway, it was just, um, so it's described that, that, um, even though we cannot completely understand God, he's uh, inconceivable, and it's, one of his names is Ahuxaja, it's meaning he can't, he can't be perceived by the material senses. Our teachers tell us that because we're samples of God, we can, if we can understand our own mind to some degree, we can also understand the mind of God because we're, we're samples uh, uh, of that same spiritual energy and consciousness. And so this world is described as, as being a reflection of the spiritual world where there are personalities, the Supreme Personality and so many other devotees in different moods or rasas. And those uh, build and they're enjoyed um, by Krishna. That's how he feels loved. And, and Shanta is the first one. Oh, Asya really is right. the second one where one where you, if you like somebody and you respect them, it, it gives you pleasure to do service for that person. Uh, you know, as, a, as an offering of, of love. Uh, you might hold the door for, even that ran, you know, someone you just hold the door for, open for someone, or you cook them a meal, or you do something out of wanting to give something, some of your service. Uh, and then there's, that's, and then the next one is, is uh, Sakya, or friendship, where you respect that person, you want to serve them, but then there becomes like a friendly relationship mixed within those other three, or the other, other two, rather. And then there's another relationship where one can be a, a uh, see God as his child. And that's another whole different mood where, and it's built on the previous three because a child you, you respect, you know, you want to serve them. You're, you have a friendly relationship with them. And, uh, but there's more, it's like the, they, you feel like they can't exist without you. And well, you don't feel like you know that. And there's something with that dependence and that, that willing, loving services, um, appreciated by the child so even god will take the, the role of a child to have that to feel the love of a parent and then there's a, a conjugal love where there's an whereas there's a spiritual of equi equivalent of very intimate exchange where the, the lover is completely sold out to the beloved and the same is true it goes uh it comes back in the same way so uh, anyway that that is the this all begs the question of, of God being a person and, and how we exchange with him. As, and uh, there's so much talk in spiritual circles about negation, about everything is illusion, including feelings, including knowledge that it's all just will of the wisp. What's here today is gone tomorrow and there's no reality. And uh, spiritual realization means just becoming basically, or that attempt to become desireless and feelingless just to escape the pain of uh, what we feel in the material world. But that's, that negation is only a negation of the false ego and material exploitation. It's not a negation of the ability to love and express love and feel love and exchange love. So that's, I think, uh, and that you do with a person. And that's why we've been expanded as samples of the Supreme to exchange love. So mm. that's kind of a long winded answer, but uh, maybe you can add to that. Yeah, that's so so beautiful, Bojude Prabhu. Thank you. Um, I, I was thinking as you were talking about the verse from the Gita where Krishna makes it clear that like if you offer me something with you know whether it's a, a leaf or a piece of fruit or water, a flower, um, or in incense on your home altar, that you know if you're doing it sincerely and offering it to me, that's good for me. I'm good. I'll take it. You know. <laughs> And that the bar is so low, it's, it's as simple, you could say, as sincerity in the heart to please God, that, that that's a part of the intention to do something for God, whether it's chanting or, you know, taking time to journal. A lot of people have prayer journals. In, in Bhakti, of course, we chant the Maha Mantra or we do Kirtan or we read the Shastras or talk about Krishna. But any of these things, if they're if it's done with just the like the simplest intent to to please um, God, then God says yes. And it seems to me that that if we just keep doing that, that God also reveals within our own hearts the unique way in which each 
soul is meant to have that exchanged. In other words, what's so what you know in the situation that the woman gave, she said, "I wanted to know what I could do to make my daughter feel loved," and so I asked her. And it's as though the the more that we just use a good intention to try to, try to offer God something, the more that what we're doing by means of that is to ask God, well, what do you like? It, it's as though if we just keep offering things slowly from within our heart, God says, this is your nature. And according to your nature and my nature, we have a very unique, totally unique relationship. And through that unique relationship, I'm going to let you know what I like. You're going to learn who you are really as a being, as you figure out also what I like. And that to me, it's like, it's like, uh, it's taking what the woman did with her daughter to a whole different level, because it's, it's sort of be like, if the daughter also had something, you know, th- said, well, mom, I like it when you love me like this. And I love it when dad loves me like this. And I love it. And that's how we are as people too. We, I mean, some person might like hugs and, um, you know, caressing someone, hug, holding someone. And she might like it when her mom does that in a very particular situation, but she might like it you know, very differently of how her dad loves her or how her sister loves her. The different. So I think it's also true that if I mistake, correct me if I'm wrong, Bojade Prabhu, but what I was hearing you say is also that as we, as we just seek to love God, that very intimately God starts showing up and saying, there's a very specific way that I like to be loved according to who you are and, and kind of how, how I've made you, how I live within you. And that that starts being revealed to us. And it, it's like almost also, it's, it's like revealing your part in a, in a play or something like, this is the role you're playing. Um, uh, does that make sense, Bojadev? Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you express a lot of points very nicely. And, and, um, and God is, you know, we understand from our teachers that God is so liberal that he allows himself to be loved in the way that we like to love him as well. Right. You know, right. That, uh, when in that verse where he says, you know, offer me a fruit and a flower, um, he says, I will accept it. You know, it's not that just we offer it and then it's gone, but he says, I accept it. And then the, we have the concept of prasadam where is like you can offer him a meal. And again, he doesn't, it's just a vehicle for your, for an expression of your loving feelings. He actually accepts that meal and then he leaves it for you to taste those remnants and for people that have had, you know, we suffer years that sometimes people come to the, the Christian temples and we would have, you know, as a theme started from the 60s of having a love feast. And people would say, you know, do you guys put drugs in this food or something? That just, the food tastes so good. I just get this amazing, amazing feeling. And, you know, if I, I've asked the cooks and I take it home and follow the recipe, it just doesn't turn out the same. What is the, what's the deal here, you know? And so that reciprocation of, of uh, God reaching out, you know, you reaching out to God, and he reaches back with, with a tangible feeling of, of his reciprocation. It's a very personal and wonderful thing. And then, uh, you know, and then it leads to more. And so, you know, our teachers sometimes will say, well, you know, God is willing to accept the most simple thing that any, anybody can find a flower and water. But uh, we shouldn't think if we have more at our disposal, we should just limit our offerings to flowers and a cup of water, <laughs> you know, right, that, right, right. You know, I mean, if you're uh, you could build a temple, you could do all types of things according to your resources. And it's not that God is, is, is uh, obligated to anything material that you're providing. If you're, if you're trying to do business with him, he's not, he doesn't need it. But what he's looking for is that offering from the heart, that surrender. If I want to give you everything. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the, pro- there's nine processes of devotional service, as you mentioned, of hearing, chanting, remembering, offering foodstuffs, becoming a servant. And the, la- and the last one, you can do any one of the nine, but as the, the last one is offering everything. It's, it's whatever is in your possession. And there's actually, it's described as a, an exchange of opulences with the Supreme Lord. That whatever opulence we offer him, he offers another opulence back to us, which comes in the form of realization or ecstasy or, or full knowledge or even mystic powers come to the devotee without seeking them. It's just part of the path of bhakti that some yogis seek mystic powers for their own ends. But as the soul in the path of bhakti is traveling towards purity, all those the sample qualities of God, of, of which are some of us, of, of, of which are very mystical, 
are revealed and given to a devotee without devotee without him even being sought out. And so you see in the lives of devotees, they can, they read people's minds, they have a sense of past, present, and future. There's all these things that just naturally come, which other people, you know, are really think might think might be the goal of spiritual life, but this is that's just like a side corollary benefit. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um like the the thing that I love about this individual's question was that the question itself is already it already demonstrates the spirit of bhakti, right? That was another thing that I was thinking about was that oh, this is something my guru Dave Vaisheshika Maharaj says a lot. He you know he's like someone will ask a very concerned question about whether I'm getting something right or not in spiritual life, and sometimes he'll just say the fact that you're concerned about getting something right or not, you know, that you're thinking about pleasing Krishna by your actions or your practice of bhakti and how you could, you know, be better at it or more pleasing to God that in and of itself is pleasing to God. And, um, and it, another symptom of bhakti that I think, so it's, it's interesting that the, the, the question is already in the mood of bhakti. And I just think that, that, that whenever I've heard that, it's also helped me to relax and remember to just keep asking that question, what, what pleases God? Because it in and of itself is like a little love letter that we're sending to God in our mind or our thoughts. Um, oh, one more thing. You, you also mentioned asking people who know. And um, one of the things that I think is so unique about bhakti is that Krishna also, one of the things that is, is dearest to, to Krishna, you know, the, the dearest are his devotees. So the, in other words, the people, what does Krishna love the most? The people that love him. So there's this loving exchange back and forth. And um, so another way of pleasing Krishna that's in the scriptures all over the place is if you want to um, please Krishna, then you know, find ways to serve and please the people that love Krishna. So there's a big thing in, you know, in the bhakti tradition, which is that we serve one another, that people who participate in bhakti are very concerned with um, treating one another with love and respect, but more than that, to um, be, to, to see Krishna in the devotees, because the, the people who love Krishna so much, it's like that, that Krishna, the, the vibrancy of Krishna in the hearts just really there. And so it's like, well, do, you know, help people out, help in, in the temple, or, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can, you can serve in the sort of um, community of, of people in bhakti. But I guess one of the simple things that we say a lot uh, is if you want to love Krishna, um, love the people that love Krishna, because that's really, that makes Krishna really, really happy. And I, I think of that as similar to what Jesus said when asked what were the greatest commandments. And he, he quotes the Old Testament scriptures, the the law, and he says, love God with everything that you've got. And then love as an extension of that. The second law is similar to the first, but it's different, which is to love uh, your neighbor and um, as you love yourself. And to me, it's like, that's also this extension of bhakti. If you love bhakti, if you love God in others and serve, especially those who are actively seeking that connection with God. If you try to help them in their path and support them and encourage them and, you know, be there for them, that also makes Krishna really happy. Yeah, that's very true. It's, um, and Krishna directly says, says that and reinforces that and says that he who claims that he's my devotee is, is not my devotee, but he says that he's the devotee of my devotee that's my devotee because we learn how to approach you know we have a you know it's difficult and it's understood that well you know god is unlimited we'll never understand all of his qualities but to understand that he's a person and approach him in that way we get to practice by approaching our guru and, and approaching um people that that we hold in high regard that, that are that are advanced in the path of bhakti and offer them respect, offer them friendship, offer them uh, service. And uh, that automatically enriches, you know, the, uh, it starts that reciprocation and Krishna sees that and appreciates that. Um, again, in the Gita, he said that no one's more dear to him that, than one who explains the science of Bhagavad Gita to other devotees. Because it's, it's kind of like in this material world, we, we've all lost our way and we've forgotten that we're actually 
in a sense, like the the sons of the of the emperor and or the king. And the example is given if someone reminds someone who's kind of like lost, wandering the street, and said, "You you have a, a wonderful home, you have a palace, you know, around the corner. You've just forgotten. You're part of that culture. You're a part of that life." You should, and it kind of directs that person back to the gates of the palace. That's the best service one can do, and that is very much appreciated by Krishna. And uh, and sometimes Prabhupada, our our spiritual master, would would say that uh, just like if you approach a powerful person who's walking their dog, if you pet the dog, and uh, you know are kind to that dog, then you endear yourself to that powerful person. So he, would, in his humility, would say, "So I'm just like Krishna's dog." And uh, in a sense, <laughs> that <for> you, <laughs> um, we should see ourselves as just, uh, you know, humble servants of the Supreme. And uh, if you serve that person and, um, you know, and a person who has real humility, like we saw, you'll see in great spiritual masters, hum humility is so genuine that uh, at one point in Bhakti, it's described that, that, uh, you, you should, like you would offer the ambassador of a country all the respect you would offer the president of the company, the president of the country. So as an ambassador of bhakti, the spiritual master is offered all the respects of God, but he's not God, nor does he expect those res expect that, but it's part of his duty to accept and guide on as a representative. So um, with you know, with knowledge and humility, one can play that role and, um, you know, spread knowledge of God and, and spread love of God. And that's something that um, we're all called to do. I mean, there's certain people in the bhakti tradition that take on more formal initiating guru or instructing guru roles, but we're also in bhakti, we're a tradition where the, the shiksha or instructing guru um, is, you know, I, I might play that role to, you know, in a sense to, um, to other people who are just brand new to Bhakti. My knowledge is very, very limited compared to a lot of people, you know, but I might have just a bit more than someone who knows nothing has. And in that sense, I'm trying to faithfully explain the same philosophy and, and teachings um, in the same way that, a, that a, any other formal guru might be expected to. And in that sense, we, we're all playing that role. We're all, uh, we all might fall into positions for periods of our life or even just moments in our life where um, we have to act as that representative. Uh, is that accurate, Bojo Dave? 100%. It's 100%. Actually, uh, our spiritual master said he, he, by, actually, Lord Chaitanya said, by my order, everyone should become guru in this sense of, of repeating the same thing that, that Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. It's not like we're inventing something. We're not, you know, new gurus popping out of the woodwork with a new, you know, a new formula, you know. And, right. And it's, a, it's something that's been practiced for thousands of years. And if you learn that science and just repeat that science, that qualifies you as like an instructing guru. And it's, mm -hmm. and probably, even, you know, I have a book here where when our, our teacher would give lectures, like he would, he could quote from that literally thousands of Sanskrit verses that he knew by heart that just came to him. Yeah. That were just, it was uncanny. It was like, I still read it today after almost 50 years. And I think, how did, how did he, uh, how is he so, he's so amazingly empowered. And, uh, but, and the, but he would say, you know, our job isn't hard. We just repeat what has been said by our predecessor teachers and hand down the knowledge. So we're not, we don't have to concoct anything, concoct anything, come up with some new, you know, latest and greatest. It's just this, the, the simple truth given heart to heart is very powerful. And we can do that as on different levels. And that's mm -hmm. actually even the duty of a, of a father or a teacher or people's responsibility is to share wisdom with, with those that um, are open to seek it. Yeah. And, and, um, this reminds me of something that I was thinking about earlier, which is um, another symptom of bhakti. Um, one of the symptoms of, of bhakti, it's also described in the scripture. And when we say scriptures, by the way, we should mention that we're not, we're not talking about like, um, you know, the, the Bible or something like that. We're, the scriptures in the Vedic tradition are really interesting because it flows downward from the Vedas through the Upanishads, through Vedanta Sutra, through the Puranas, um, and the and the Gita 
And so there's, there's, it's a myriad, it's like a, a huge mandala of sacred texts. And um, they're all, there's many of them that are part of the bhakti traditions, not just like one book or something like that. I mean, even the Bible, you know, composed of what, 66 books from three different continents over 1500 years in three different languages or something like that. So it's important to remember that most sacred text traditions are, are a compilation of different wisdom um, streams that, that are c- coming together to represent the essence of, of, of something. So in this sense, you know, you have the Bhagavad Purana, the Bhagavad Gita, the Sri Ishupanishad. There's a number of other texts that we read in the Bhakti tradition that are like the essence of Bhakti yoga ph- philosophy. And there's, there's other types of yoga and, and lineages with their own texts as well. Um, in, in regard to the symptom of Bhakti though, is that the more that one you know, immerses themselves in um, bhakti. Also, the degree to which one may question one's qualification to ever be very pleasing to Krishna may actually, and ironically, increase. And so, um, because humility in the heart is increasing and uh, love is increasing at the same time. And, and so there's this proportional growth between humility and love of God it's as though there's um, not a self-loathing or something like that, or an insecurity, or let me be perfect, or but a, a real deep concern for whether or not I'm really pleasing. Uh, and again, not an ego uh, pick on myself and be critical kind of thing, but a, a like you you would when you deeply deeply care about someone that you love, and you just you just the more that you love them, the more intensely that you you wonder am i really qual- you, am i really qualified to to really make this person happy that ironically that feeling of whether or not i'm capable or i'm that that can grow but that's a symptom of of love growing at times that that can be like a mood or a um a, a, a part of the texture of gr- growing love of god uh, that's how i've understood it anyway boja dave is that is that would you say that that's correct yeah yeah i'm the, oh, i'd uh, there's yeah, a lot of good points. I want to backtrack, and I like how you qualify that That actually, as far as scriptures, uh, the Bible is also considered scriptures in the way, if, if you look at the essence, even, even though it's been translated so many times in so many languages, and because real scripture is, you know, um, the message of someone who's got something pure in the heart that's something pure in the heart has been revealed, and that's been noted down, that's been written down. Mm-hmm. And it survives, you know, even if, if fundamentalists and literalists may get caught up in certain points, but if the essence of the, what makes something a scripture, if the essence of it teaches one how to love God progressively, mm-hmm. and that can be found in the Bible, that can be found in different steps and different traditions. Um, but it's the, the realization that comes to the heart. And, and as to your point of seeking more and questioning more, if the service, the approach they're taking is pleasing. That come from that confirmation also comes from within the heart. Um, you know, you question, you question, but there's just a sense of knowingness, a sense of revelation, of of remembering. You know, that we're we're never really separated from Krishna, but it's our own false ego that makes us identify things in the world as something separate from God. Mm-hmm. But as the more we practice offering those things, you see that there's very intimate connection, and it's described that one of the ways that you that's confirmed that you're going in the right direction that loving service is being accepted is is meeting at one point actually meeting the lord in the heart and taking directions internally um, and progressively directly from uh, the lord in the heart Mm -hmm. it's described that one sees a uh, like an like an internal television set where it has a completely different vision of reality a transcendent reality that's seen through the heart Actually, it's described as another topic, but it's described that the mind is uh, actually situated in the heart, in the subtle mind. So it's through that heart revelation that you find, see, and find God and talk directly. And that, that confirmation of your uh, and loving exchange becomes known and felt intuitively and, and quite confidently. You, you get that reciprocation that your steps have been acknowledged and reciprocated. Right. Yeah, that's, that's really, really beautiful and really... Um... Um, affirming and and super comforting. And, and I was probably talking about something that's well beyond where most of us are, which is that, you know, these stories and 
help me try to explain this, Boji. There, there's stories though where you have, say, the um, the gopis or the or Radha, who are these, you know, in the in the shastras, they're depicted as the you know the the embodiment of of the lover and the um, the the lover and the beloved, and they're they're this very high uh, level, we so to speak, of love of God and very intense level. And the 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 worry or the anxiety that they feel about pleasing God is there even in these very intense and and elevated states of of rapture in the love of God. Is that is that correct? Yeah, but it's on it's on a transcendent level. It's right. not the anxiety producing level of of the ego to the anxiety that we feel of self doubt or right or lack of knowledge or something. It's a whole different thing. And there's and and talking about the. Um, kind of advanced states that that, that we we learn about is that you know when we were talking earlier about like sometimes God likes to be appreciated as the you know as or as seen as the all powerful and, and with a sense of awe and reverence, but beyond that, there's a more intimate way of relating to God as a friend or as a parent or as a lover. That's a different kind of illusion. It said that the individual soul, because we're not God, we're, we're marginal potency, we'll, we'll always be in, under some type of illusion. In the material world, we're in the illusion that this is all there is. In the spiritual world, it's a very sweet kind of illusion where you forget that God is the all-powerful creator of unlimited universes. Because if you were stuck in that appreciation, there would be no intimacy. It would be like, oh my God, the grandeur is just overwhelming. How can I even approach this? source of all this in, 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 you know incredible opulence and majesty you know there's a so to and, and that's a real state and some people love that state and god loves to, to to reciprocate with people that love that state but there's another going beyond that you go into another illusion where you see god as your friend and you forget you, you don't forget you still have the respect it's not like you lose the the perspective that god is you know this amazing personality but it just becomes more intimate and the friendship is, is, reciproc is reciprocated. And um, so there's no, you know, there's no calculation. There's no anxiety is, um, that's, that you might expect. So there's an anxiety, there's an angst, but it's an, an, described as a very ecstatic angst. It's just a right. level of ecstasy that gets milked and, and increased and sweetened by wanting to do more, but it's right. not, the dis it's not the um, disappointment of this material world that where we're doubting ourselves. I yes. Think. Yeah. Per yeah. That's, and that's exactly what I was trying to get at when I was saying, it's not about that self-critical. Am I getting it right? I'm so obsessed with getting, I'm afraid of getting it wrong, but there's a, and the, the reason I'm saying this is because I think that part of the path of bhakti is about learning to identify the spiritual source or the spiritual version of a lot of emotions that we feel because if we try to eliminate the difficult emotions altogether people tend to get a little um almost it becomes it can become very impersonal like like the point of spiritual life is to just be in a, a very tranquil state of peace 24 7 but i think in bhakti the thing that's so appealing is that actually we're trying to bring the entire range of emotions, the entire variegatedness of, of experience itself into uh, the process of learning how to love God. And so any way that we can try to understand anxiety or, you know, any of the more difficult emotions it, and understand that there is a spiritual counterpart to that, there's a way in which that that emotion or that experience is complete and, and perfect and can uh, take part in, in devotional reality, maybe not right now, you know, but it helps us to understand so that we don't end up kind of um, saying like, you know, in other words, how, how do you like, again, my encouragement to the woman asking the question, which was just that you have any anxiety about this at all and any, any real desire to please Krishna, even if it's a, a little bit of a worry that that, that emotion is valuable to God. Is that, does that make sense, Bojadev? Yeah, no, it's a super important aspect uh, of understanding that whatever we experience in this world is actually has its is a reflection of what exists in the spiritual world. And it goes to the point I was trying to address earlier that just because we see things that are illusory and temporary in this world doesn't mean that there, there isn't a, 
an original source of that variety that is real. Just like you right. can have a counterfeit bill, that doesn't mean there's no real currency. So right. the uh, all the variety of experience, anything that that is seen here has its origin in spirit. So, but it, there it's impurity, and here it's it's shadow form. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. just like you know, when facing the sun, when the sun rises, it's a nice example of of understanding God or self-realization is that when, the, you know, when you're in complete darkness, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. But when the sun rises, you can not only see yourself, but you can see the sun and the source of light. So as, as uh, you know, spiritual life and knowledge is revealed and the personalities of Godhead is re reveals himself, you see him, you see all the varieties that exist in spirit, you see yourself, you see yourself as active in those. And as opposed to the shadow representations in this world, which are all, which are temporary and illusory because the uh, they're manifested in matter, which is always changing, but our spiritual essence is, is non-material and experience of those higher realms has to do with appreciating all those varieties mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and they're become different components of ecstatic experience. And, you know, Bhakti is very different in this regard by, because a lot of, there are quite a few mystical traditions that will say, you know, this, the shadows um, are anything that is dual in nature, light between interplay between light and dark, or good and bad, or you know, happy and sad, or any any dualities whatsoever. That they're all false. That they're all shadow, and that we want to get rid of all of it and um, transcend it. You know, go go beyond it all. And Bhakti says, no, it's all it's all it's all real, just as real as, um, you know, if you're playing outside with, um, like, uh, my, my kids have this, this ball and you can pull it apart and it turns into this big, crazy globe. And then you can smash it down to a little thing. And they pull it apart to a big globe. It casts this huge shadow on the grass that looks like this big architectural mandala on the grass. Mm -hmm. And the point is that the, the shadow is real it's a real phenomenon it's not the same as the ball itself but it is real it has reality and so like plato in in the um allegory of the cave we're, we're speaking of the seeing the light of the sun C -c prisoner comes out of the cave sees the sun i think i think plato personally with his contacts with egypt and with india's contacts with egypt i've i've read a number of really good essays suggesting that Plato either in a vicarious manner might've gotten in touch with some of the Vedic tradition. And it makes a lot of sense to me, but at any rate, that's an aside. So you, you know, that some traditions are, are going to want to say that, that you want to, it's all illusion, get rid of all of it. And Bhakti is more like saying, uh, no, there's, there's a kind of um, reflect, reflection, illusion kind of, of, of the real thing here. But the more that we evolve in our consciousness that we kind of can, can come to um, essentially take our real form in the real world. And uh, at which point we, what we'll have, what we begin to understand is that the, the material appearance of things in this world is illusory, but what it is reflective of in the spiritual world is actually real as are each of us as individual souls. So the purpose isn't to, um, transcend the illusion of having an actual identity or an actual spirit soul or transcend the illusion of differences or variety for the sake of some kind of singularity where your individual's autonomous existence is gone or the existence or interplay of different unique things is gone. No, we want, those things are real. We just want to, um, partake in the reality of those relationships as opposed to the, um, the illusory, level of of relationship and that requires this kind of shift in in consciousness and and the way that that shift in consciousness takes place is to really to to understand and see god at the center of all of those relationships because that's how they're they're made divine and they're they're made perfect in in love sorry i just went off on a rant there but is that how does that make sense Boja dave no no it makes it makes perfect sense and if if a person actually can grasp this concept that that this concept and apply it that um our our viewpoint on that duality of what's illusion what's not and what's real and what's not i, I could kind of re try and recap that in saying that that uh our understanding is it's like when you have a dream 
you might have a dream and you're very fearful or you're having a good time. Um, that dream is not real and that it's not in, it, it doesn't last. But the, but the experience of that dream is real. So when you're dreaming that or you're experiencing that at the time, it is real, but it's temporary. Mm -hmm. So what kind of defines something as illusory in this world is that it's temporary. It doesn't last. It's made of matter. It's going to be created. It's going to last for some time and be destroyed. That's the realm that we're, that's the big cosmic sandbox that we're in is everything composed of matter um, will appear for some time. And, and in a sense, it's, it's uh, false because it crumbles at some point. It's not, it's not, uh, doesn't represent a high reality, but that doesn't mean that, that it, uh, it doesn't have some truth to it because it brings into context that, that everything is God's energy. And you can see God, when you can see God within everything, even the material and the spiritual, um, God can speak to you through even those shadow uh, manifestations. Mm -hmm. So Krishna says, one of the ways you can realize me is the, uh, that I'm the taste of water. I'm the light of the sun and the moon, all these things that appear uh, material if you see them as coming from the source, then it reminds you of the existence of, of the source of everything mm -hmm. and all that is. And uh, so, yeah, identifying something as false and rejecting it is not as complete as understanding it may be temporary, but there's real energy behind it. That energy comes from the source of all energy of all material and spiritual um, manifestations. And you can begin to see, you know, and appreciate God with, God with it's God's presence and hand within the, the web of even this material world and its shadows mm -hmm. instead of rejecting it as something less you know, than going towards some type of monism with there was no variety. There's no personality and there's no two different objects or people to exchange love. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think that's an important, another important point there is that um, this material world itself is, here to facilitate the desires of beings who wish to e explore um, essentially what it means to um, be apart from or have the temporary illusion of being apart from God. And that, that there is a whole realm, a whole energy that's that facilitates that experience for as long as souls want to have that experience, and as in a, in a sense, this realm and this material energy, uh, sometimes called Maya, or you hear sometimes people call it in other traditions samsara, um, but that this um, this energy is also uh, Maya also means mercy and is a, is a servant of God. And one of the roles that Maya plays is to facilitate the desires of beings who, who want to have this kind of separative experience. And as we go along, the, the, the energy of this world is always giving us feedback. That's always tailored very uniquely to each soul to help them, uh, remember and awaken to, um, the fact that it's a lot happier to be in truth. It's a lot happier to be in, in the light of God, so to speak. Um, but it's not, it's not that we're condemned for being here. In fact, we're, this realm facilitates our being here because we're loved. And in, in, in the ultimate awakening that we have in this realm, in a sense, is to, to understand that that love is, has been extended for us and that we can uh, turn and go return home in a sense. And as soon as we do that, we're also, we begin to be filled with mercy and compassion for the nature of suffering souls and, and the suffering of the world. Um, we're able to see it more in the light of God. And so it's anything but some kind of condemnation of, of um, diversity or even this realm itself, um, because this realm itself is also an eternal servant of God. It's described as something that gets expanded out from, you know, Vishnu's, uh, like, like countless material universes coming out of uh, Vishnu's body. Like, you know, those, one of those bubble machines that my kids have, where they just like pour out and then eventually, you know, they're, they're sucked back in. And, and this is, um, you know, es essentially described as um, something that is, uh, it's, it, it, the process itself is uh, without beginning or end. It's, 
it's a it's a it's an aspect of God or an aspect of of reality itself that this is happening. Um, and to in again, the thing that really helps me is to remember that behind that is like this this desire to that the, 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 this is described as like a, a wish fulfilling tree. It's like, oh, okay, you know, you can come here and like have your own choose choose your own adventure fantasy where you maybe have forgotten who you are, forgotten what you're a part of. But as you go along, you know, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep nudging you. And um, so it's not like this, this realm is like bad or, or a, a, it, it, that there's some punitive wrath because we're here or against materiality or something like that. But it also is what it is. And we have to learn about it as we go. Yeah. On that uh, note of the, the universe is expanding. It's described how Vishnu breathes out. He exhales and manifest and then he breathes in and, and brings it all back. So even, you know, sometimes you can observe things in matter that, that um, correspond to what's being symbolically represented. So it, it's described that the, the universe seems to be expanding, you know, and that's described as the breath of Vishnu. He's expanding, then it contracts. So it's, in a, it's always in a state of expansion and contraction. But touching on, what you said as as far as you know our original identity is we're not really ever separate from god it's like you're you know you're if you look at your kids your kids are all your kids so from point, god's point of view we're never really separated but if we want that you know that have that experience that's what the material world about is it's a facilitation for that and a facilitation for experiencing and a, a, a try to ex, uh, experience the separation from god but it's also the same means to get back to your original um nature because all the ingredients it's described in the gita that the that the everything in the in the universe is ingredients for sacrifice to actually see it as gods and use it in god's service and therefore get back to our original consciousness but as you know i, I read an example um the other day is along the lines that we were saying that's not punitive that even though it's not really possible to be separate from god as spiritual energies as sparks of that, that spiritual fire uh sometimes we want which is not something which is not possible to experience mm -hmm. some separation so probably said in one of the explanations to a, a um something in bhagavatam where he said just like the child will cry for the moon but so the mother will get a mirror and put it in the child's hand and see the reflection of the moon to satisfy that child that the moon is actually now in their hand so <laughs> right right that's <laughs> so this world is a a reflection of a, a higher reality. And uh, if we want to be dazzled by the reflection of the moon in the mirror, then uh, we can stay here as, you know, and do that as long as we want. But then there's, you know, as time goes on and maybe there's some realization that there's more uh, than just uh, dazzling, right. <laughs> dazzling reflections. And that's so amazing because a, a, a little segue here and probably something that we, we can close on because we're just about out of time. The moon in ancient astrology is, and in also in Vedic astrology, the moon is associated with Krishna. Um, and the, um, of course, the, the golden avatar, the Kali Yuga, the incarnation of Krishna that we, um, who we follow in bhakti yoga lord chaitanya uh he's one of the ones that sort of the the advent of uh kirtan in the streets and uh it was like this uh, really fascinating figure that i i'm still just getting to know over the past three four years of my life um who was born under a lunar eclipse um the moon in ancient astrology has a dual meaning um uh, on the one hand, it, it has to do with forgetfulness, sleep, slumber, um, because it is a reflective light and not an original light. It was associated with the intoxication of material life, of, of not remembering that you're a spirit soul because you are lost in the illusion. On the other hand, the dual meaning of the moon was remembrance. Um, and for example, chanting on a set of mala with 108 uh, beads, uh, which is the number of the moon, you know, one of the numbers of the moon in ancient astrology. So that the act of remembrance and devotion, like a mother stays devoted and concerned and connected to the child or the child to the mother, that there's a, a, a sweetness in, in, a, in, a, in a sense 
we we remember what and and so when we learn to see the the spirit of god illumined in the world through uh, the, the cultivating the love of god through through a practice like bhakti that the the um the remembrance and it's, we start to see within the world that the reflection of that higher reality we see god reflected in everything and that was also associated with the moon which is why we also see the av- one of the avatars you know the, the, of of god um the, the we say one of the i don't remember it was the 7th or the 8th vishnu avatar or whatever that that's mentioned in the bhagavad purana but krishna is also associated with the moon and and rightfully so since he's like the uh the <laughs> That you know he he's he doesn't take a human form in a, in a literal sense, but he comes into a familiar human form as an avatar and and as as a part of helping us to remember. Uh, same thing in the silver chair the, from the Narnia Chronicles. Aslan gives the instructions. Um, you know, don't don't forget, don't forget. In fact, um, let me read something to you guys. Uh, this is so nice. So the silver chair was. I'm trying to think. It was a third or the fourth um, in. Um, of the Narnia Chronicles, but um, it's the book of the moon, the silver chair being the metal of the moon. Um, and let's see if I can just, here it is. He's talking to the heroine of the book, a girl named Jill, and he's telling her how to succeed when she goes into Narnia, which is a place where the air is denser. Now, remember in ancient astrology, the moon was the planet that governed the threshold between the material realm and the spiritual realms of the planets where you're increasingly spiritual realms of the planets and um uh the sublunary realm was denser and you were prone to forgetting or falling asleep in it well lewis plays on that in the silver chair listen to what he says to jill but first remember 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 the signs say them to yourself when you wake in the morning And when you lie down at night and when you wake in the middle of the night and whatever strange things may happen to you, let nothing turn your mind from following the signs. Might as well be telling her to repeat a mantra, right? And secondly, I give you a warning. Here on the mountain, I have spoken to you clearly. I will not often do so down in Narnia. Here on the mountain, the air is clear and your mind is clear. As you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take great care that it does not confuse your mind. And the signs which you have learned here will not look at all as you expect them to look when you meet them there. That is why it is so important to know them by heart and pay no attention to appearances. Remember the signs and believe the signs. Nothing else matters. Courage, dear heart. No great wisdom can be reached without sacrifice. Isn't that a really nice? And that's Aslan, the, the God figure, uh, giving instructions to this young girl in the lunar book of the series about how to, um, how to make it through and not get lost. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. It's, yeah. Uh, uh, one, one final thought on that too, is that you were mentioning Lord Chaitanya and, and he just left eight shlokas and one in the first or eight, eight prayers. And one line in that, as you, I'm sure you know, in that first prayer is that this chanting spreads the rays of the benedic- benediction moon. There it is. Yeah. Benediction. It's, uh, and it's described that just like you start with a dark moon and then it gradually increases, increases each day and through the cycle until it's full and bright and shining and giving its full benediction. So starting in the, you know, rooting out the darkness in the mind and, and letting the light, you know, starts as a crescent and then it grows. And, uh, you know, the moon and the sun are considered eyes of the Supreme because not only he is watching us, but he allows us to see by his own eyes, but from the light that comes from both the uh, the sun and the moon and and just as a side i always uh, this is just a strange observation but i'm always stunned when i see moon shadows i don't know when you see if you're out in a full moon and you see the shadow i saw the the shadow of a tree in the full moon the other day and i thought how amazing is that the light goes from the sun bounces off the moon comes back to us and creates a whole different reality you know the shadow reality which in itself is beautiful in, in ways but Again, it's uh, it's just a temporary manifestation, but anyway, <laughs> beautiful, yeah, so beautiful. Um, and and it, you know, ancient astrologers were also they paid a lot of attention to whether it was daytime or nighttime, a nocturnal or diurnal chart. There's a sacred alchemy between the sun and the moon um, in ancient astrology throughout. That's uh, so beautiful. So. Um, yeah, this has been really, really fun. Um, and I just get lit up whenever I talk to Bojo Dave Prabhu. So I'm really thankful for him being here today. Um, yeah, thank good. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Bojadev, um, 
I wanted people to uh, find your website again or your, with your blog um, because you write occasionally um, some really nice pieces. Um, uh, they're always nice. Occasionally you, you'll, you'll update it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> clarify that. Um, so. You're very um, generous. Well, wh- where, do, wh- what is the name of the website? It's called symphonyofspirit.com. And symphony there's a landing of page at symphony of spirit, all one word, all dot com. And then at the, there's a blog as, as one of the, uh, there's I think four pages and the fifth page is a blog. So you can go to the blog directly by symphony of spirit slash blog dot HTML, or just go to symphony of spirit. And it's kind of inter- introductory background um, information on spirituality with that. The idea is that everyone plays their own instrument, um, but can be part of a, a grander symphony and uh, to produce, produce a wonderful sound and atmosphere of, and, uh, participate in a greater reality. So, so there's music, there's different types of music that uh, kind of I co-opt to, to emphasize points that may be uh, interpreted <laughs> in, a, in a spiritual uh, viewpoint, but who knows if the, the creator of that piece thought was thinking the same thing. But I think that's the, the um, one of the functions of art is that it, it expresses itself uniquely in each person's mind who is the viewer. So uh, that's much the way God does. So. Mm. Um, I love that. Well, I, I feel like these, oh, I'm sorry, Prabhu, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say you can find it there. Okay, great. Yeah. Symphonyofspirit.com. I feel, I was going to say, I feel like these um, talks, I'm going to start calling them something like uh, Bhakti with Bojadev, <laughs> something. <laughs> so we need you a nickname. Too much credit. That's a, it's a, well, but it's really, it's, it's, it's very, uh, I'm, you know, so happy. This is what, uh, I mean, this is the way it's described in Bhakti, the way that we exchange love with each other is to reveal our mind and then listen while another person reveals their mind to, to give food, accept food, to give gifts, receive gifts. So, you know, this exchange uh, on this level is just, uh, to me, it's, it's the most satisfying thing. So I'm grateful that uh, you made the time for it. Absolutely. Well, for those of you who are listening and really enjoyed this, you were just practicing bhakti. That's this is the part of what bhakti is the the, the exchange of of thoughts and listening to people talk about bhakti. You know, no matter where we're at. So, um, thank you again, Bojadev Prabhu. If you all want to check out more bhakti content, this is one of my crossover videos. You can go to my website nightlightastrology.com, click on the bhakti tab. You can sign up for free private bhakti YouTube channel content. Um, that I usually do once a week. Um, so there's a, there's a whole archive there. If you want to get a bhakti practice going, I highly recommend starting with my video series, Easy Practices of Surrender. The mantra meditation practice in particular will teach you how to get a mantra meditation practice going. Um, there's lots more that we hope to do. So hopefully we'll have uh, we'll have you back, Bojadev, in, um, in the new year. But in the meantime, um, everybody out there, I hope that you guys uh, have a, a beautiful holiday season and that this inspires something good in you. All right. That's what we've got for today. Take it easy, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Take care.